Michelle. And I'm Lucy. Welcome to another Cameo episode. These very short episodes will be slotted in between the other ones and will cover people who made a fleeting yet tantalizing appearance in other episodes. We don't always have a lot of information about them, so they can't have a full episode of their own, but they are too interesting to abandon completely and they fill in the gaps and enable us to create as full a picture of the era as we can. And today... Roger Machado. And I'm reliably informed by Google Translate that it is pronounced Machado. And not Machado, not Machado, Machado, <laughs> <laughs> okay. any of those. <laughs> Machado. <laughs> <laughs> well, research on him, was on Roger Machado, was somewhat hampered by the fact that there are Roger Machados all over the place. As a footballer, oh. a conductor, yes, and a, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu expert. I knew about the Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh-huh. expert. <laughs> My husband's very into martial arts. He has several black belts. Oh, right. So he knows his Roger Machados. But I never knew there was a conductor. Apparently. So they're all pretty, all three of those would be fairly prominent then. Right. Interesting. Yeah. And I'm assuming those are current. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Those are what come up when you Google Roger Machado. Well, I'm pretty sure Google doesn't think that everybody's going to be looking a couple of hundred years ago. <laughs> Some obscure herald of diplomats. <laughs> I can't even remember which episode we mentioned him in, but I do remember gratuitously slipping him in, apropos of nothing, just so that we could do an episode on him. Because <laughs> he's interesting for two reasons. There's one, he's a herald, and we've not really looked at what they did. No, not at all. And two, the way we know about him is interesting, since he's largely known through archaeological records as well as literary sources. Archaeological records? His house was excavated. Really? And his stuff was in the in the cellar. That's amazing. So we're going to have more information about a herald than we do, say, Lady Gordon, who was Perkin Warbeck's wife. I couldn't find anything on Lady Gordon. So, yes. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And we know that it was his stuff because he'd also written an itinerary. Not itinerary. Okay. Inventory? Inventory. I did that last time. We could have copied and pasted that out of two other episodes. <laughs> an inventory. In fact, it's not a word that leaps to my mind. Just, yeah, he'd written an inventory, and in the inventory was exactly what was found in the cellar, except a few more things were found in the cellar because he'd bought more stuff since he'd written the inventory. Yes, but it's interesting that it... Uh, did a disaster happen? Cause that I you don't, don't know. I wondered that because it seems odd that he would have just left to it to walk away and leave your things. It's almost like Pompeii or something. But yeah, no? if he died of a disease, you would think the next person who moved in would have cleared out his stuff or used some or done something with it. They wouldn't have just left it there. I love these kinds of things. It's, I thought I very happen. strange. I mean, it must have been very odd to, to have ex- it's a house in, in Southampton. To have excavated it and found, oh, look, there's a load of stuff here. And then somebody yeah. cross reference because they knew that he'd lived there and thought, ah, we've got a list of everything here. I thought, wow, Weird. that must have been a, a wonderful moment where you put the two together. Yeah. And you think this is Roger Machado's house and this is his stuff. Was it the Time Team crew? No. Oh, okay. no. I think it was done in the 70s. Not by them. No. By, okay. By bog standard archaeologists <laughs> <laughs> you are going to be hearing bangs everybody i am sorry we have had to put child locks on every cupboard to keep the cat out and he is still trying to get in and i have nowhere to lock him up sorry okay i can't hear it we don't know when he was born we don't know who he married we don't know if he had any <laughs> children <laughs> he was thought to be portuguese at least we know he spoke portuguese his name was, and I meant to look this up on Google Translate, it's R-U-Y, so I'll go for Ri. And that okay. was anglicised to Roger for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why they picked Roger. Yeah, those are similar. <laughs> we'll go with that. We first hear of him in 1978. No, we don't. We first hear of him in 1478 when he is the Leicester Herald. And the Leicester Herald was present at the marriage between Richard, Duke of Gloucester and Anne. Oh. And at Edward IV's funeral, so that was presumably him. Okay. The inventory of his house around that time shows that he must have been fairly well off. 
But something went wrong around the time of 1484 because he fled to Portugal. And that's not when he left all his stuff. It's thought oh. either there was a non-payment of debt or he fell out with King Richard. Easy to do. Yeah, yes. <laughs> to me, it seems more likely he fell out with King Richard because by 1485, he was in the service of Thomas Gray, the Marquis of Dorset. And that's... Um, wow. That's uh, and, um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Woodville's brother uh, son, or nephew. Son. Oh, sorry. I'm thinking Elizabeth of York. Yeah. Elizabeth of York's brother. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Gray was with Henry Tudor in Exiles. I guess that's why it was thought he might have fallen out with Richard because he, right. he ended up working sort of at one remove for Henry. Right. But if you remember, and we haven't done Thomas Gray yet, but I think we mentioned it at uh, possibly in Jasper's episode, that Thomas Gray tried to make a run for it. Yes. And he was captured and brought back to Henry. Yes. And soon after, Machado was well re well rewarded by Henry, so it's thought he might actually have grasped on Grey to, to Henry and said, look, he's, he's, pl he's planning to make a run for it. Get him back. Just before Bosworth, Machado was made Richmond Herald by Henry, uh, being the Earl wow. of Richmond. Yes, mm. that's, a, that's a promotion. But what was a herald? As when I decided to write this episode, I thought the answer would be quite simple. They're the people that yell out to people yeah. or their messengers. No, you enter a weird and wonderful world that's made even stranger by the fact that these positions still exist, both in Britain and Canada. What? Yeah. You can still be Richmond Herald or you can still be Blue Mantle Persuivant. These pe people really? are still doing this. <laughs> I've never heard of that in Canada. Yeah, in Canada as well. And in Scotland, individual clans sometimes have their own heralds still. Really? Yeah. Okay, so what do they do? Um, well, originally, the herald, herald was a glorified messenger. <laughs> then it got much more complicated. There's a ranking order, and herald comes above Paul Suivant and below King of Arms, and they're all under the authority of the Earl Marshal. The King of Arms can grant coats of arms and certify genealogies and titles. Okay. So if you think you're entitled to, to a title, you can take it to the King of Arms and he'll check through. And can right, heraldry. Can still do this. Yes, you can still do yes. this. And he'll check through your genealogy and make sure that you're actually entitled to what you think you're entitled to. Yes, okay. Heralds and pursuivants arrange and, and participate in the great ceremonies of state, like Richard III's wedding and... Edward the Fourth's funeral. Okay. They're also responsible for the conservation of genealogical records. Okay. And they adjudicate tournaments. Which really? Seems, yeah. Seems a bit. That seems sort of off to one side. A bit out on a limb. That one, I thought. Yeah. Yeah, I came yeah. across that one much later and thought oh, I'll put it in, but it, seems, it doesn't seem to fit in with anything else. Heralds were required to know the rank, pedigree, and heraldic device of all knights and lords, and to remember the order of precedence. Oh, my goodness. Because if you remember, I think it was in John de la Pole's episode, we heard of the unseemly tussle between some of the nobles. That they <laughs> yes, it was at a funeral. That was Edward the Fourth's funeral. Yes. That precedent. <laughs> so, so, no, me first. What me a time. first. Yes. <laughs> so you think the Herald must have messed up at that point. So I don't know whether that was Roger or whether he was a sort of relatively lowly Herald at that point. <laughs> oh, whoops. By Henry VIII's time, heralds would travel the country, making sure that only those who had obtained the authority could have a coat of arms. So rather than you come to them and say, can you check that this, this is kosher? They come to you and tell you, you shouldn't be having... So they're like a policeman for that. Mm. Yeah, it's called a visitation. And if they mm. find that you're using, using your coat of arms unofficially, they can pull it down and deface it. Oh! <gasps> Oh, that would make people so mad. Mm. Yeah, especially if you've sort of built up your reputation on, you know, your coat yeah. of arms and your title and everything. And then somebody comes along yeah. and tells you, no, mm. you're just mister, I'm afraid. And it seems that Machado was authorised to undertake visitations, but he was too busy since he was also a diplomat and he undertook a bit of trading on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Is this going to be the same as diplomats where they don't get paid so they have to have something on the side in order to keep themselves fed? Quite possibly. Yeah, that wasn't something that occurred to me. I thought, well, just that sounds quite, um, quite good. Oh, we had that with Richard Nanfan. He bought a load of salt yeah. back, didn't he? 
Yes, he did. Yeah, and I think I think uh, Machado trades in wine. Okay, I still like saying Nan Van. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you're going backwards and forwards across the channel, you might as well. It makes sense. You're already paying. Yeah, you're you already might. paying for the trip. Yeah, you might as well fill the fill it up to the gunnels with all sorts of useful things that you can make money on. Especially as you say, yes. yeah, diplomats pay was slightly dodgy, wasn't it? Sometimes. <laughs> yes, it was. Mm. All these positions of herald and pursuivant have names. So Machado was the Richmond Herald. Then he was promoted to the Norway, if that's how you pronounce it, or Norwa, I'm not sure, King of Arms. And then the Clarenceau King of Arms. And all this would mean mm. something to, to them at the time. And there's still a Norway King of Arms and a Clarenceau King of Arms to this really? day. Oh, yeah. Makes you wonder, what on earth are you doing? Is it... Is it an honorary title now, or do they have duties? Do you know? I don't know. I'm how... now going to have to really de- delve into the Canadian one. Mm. I don't know how much work there would be tracing genealogies now. I mean, maybe, maybe for Americans and Canadians and Australians, maybe they're tracing back to find out whether they're entitled to anything. Americans, I'm not sure if they would, because titles are not allowed in the U.S. That was. Done yeah. right at the beginning. Hmm. Jerry Landry, Presidency's podcast, mentioned that in one of his episodes. Well, I don't know. Is it a coat of arms allowed? don't know. If you're American I... and you've got a coat of arms, let us know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know of anybody. Well, I, it's not like I run around with, you know, nobility or anything. No. High ups in Canada either. So I don't know. No, I knew a right honourable once, but he made he got his right honourable by selling tobacco in Africa. And I thought, well, there's nothing honourable about that. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> in 1489, Machado went on a diplomatic mission with Richard Nanfan to, Nanfan. S- to Spain and Portugal. And we learned that Nanfan was one of the diplomats charged with negotiating the wedding between Arthur and Catherine of Aragon. So... Yes. Possibly that's what Machado was doing. Okay. In 1505, he was offered the office of Garter. And I don't think that means he was welcomed into the Order of Garter. I think it's some sort of official role associated with the Order of the Garter. Probably the administration of it? Maybe. I mean, they have a, apparently they have a Garter Day procession. I don't know if that's still going. Um, so might be the organisation of that. Okay. But I couldn't find out what the office entailed, but it must have been quite onerous because Machado declined the offer, claiming that he was too old and weak. Oh, so it obviously had some sort of duties. Otherwise, yeah, if I mean, it was a sinecure, you could do it. You wouldn't have to worry about being old and weak. No, I mean, well, yeah, the older and weaker, the better. I mean, you think, well, that's, I'm like, I've still got money coming in. <laughs> yes. He was still a diplomat, so maybe it's just a... Oh, I'm too old and weak. I'm thinking, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he spoke English, French, Spanish and Portuguese, and we think also Italian and Latin. And we're very lucky because we've got his journal, which tells us about some of his diplomatic trips. And how oh, often cool. do you get that? Very rarely. Mm. In August 1494, he was sent to the court of Charles VIII to discuss Charles's offer to help Henry, should the Emperor Maximilian, be fool enough to decide to support Perkin Warbeck. <laughs> <laughs> Machado was given confidential instructions by Henry. He was told to tell Charles that Henry had received information that the French ambassadors who'd been sent to Maximilian had returned with the news that he definitely intended to support Perkin. So, yeah, the, the word had just got back to Henry. Right. Brace yourself. <laughs> Maximilian's <laughs> on his side. Henry acknowledged the news that Charles had forbidden his citizens from aiding Perkin and told Charles, quote, and in regard to the said garçon, the king makes no account of him because he cannot be hurt or annoyed by him, unquote. Liar. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks for the offer, but no need because it's not, it's not a problem. He, right. to- he told Charles the only reason that Maximilian was siding with Perkin was because he was miffed about the Anglo-French agreement, which was true. <laughs> okay, yeah. And also he was miffed that Henry just didn't turn up when, at their meeting place and never <laughs> bothered to tell him. <laughs> the missive went on to tell Charles all that Henry had found out about Perkin. While Machado was there, he was to deliver Henry's offer of help in negotiating a settlement of dispute between Charles and Ferdinand of Aragon about the Kingdom of Naples. 
Also, Henry thanked Charles for his declaration that he wouldn't aid the Scots if they invaded England. Hmm. So it's quite interesting to, fi- to hear what a diplomat is told to say. Yes. Because we don't hear it from the dipl- diplomat's point of view very often. No. Machado was back with Charles in December 1494, and he was then in Italy. Charles was in Italy. And he had a message from Henry saying that he was very well and much loved by his people. <laughs> It's an odd thing to say. (laughs) (laughs) Everything was going swimmingly in Ireland. Thanks for asking. (laughs) And it continues with a message just for Machado. Quote, item. In case that the said brother and cousin of the king and others about him should speak of all touching the king of the Romans, Maximilian, and the Gasson, who is in Flanders, that's Perkin, the said Richmond may reply, that's Richmond is Machado, the Richmond Herald, as he did on his former journey, and he shall say that the king fears them not because they are incapable of hurting him or doing him injury, unquote. It's almost as if he doth protest too much. You know. <laughs> First he's saying, Perkin can't do anything to me. Now he's saying, Maximilian and Perkin can't do anything to me. Yeah. And Machado was further charged to say that if Charles was, were to inquire about the peace between England and Scotland, Machado was to reply that at his departure, Henry had received information that an embassy was about to be dispatched from Scotland to conclude peace. Now, I presume that's day Ayala. Yes. he came down to do that, didn't he? Yes, he did. It's nice when you, you think, oh, Much hang on. to quite another <laughs> <laughs> diplomat's extreme displeasure. Indeed, yes. In 1496, Machado was again at the French court. He carried a nice simple document with three items. Firstly, Henry agreed to a meeting with Charles. Secondly, there was talk of a possible marriage between the Dauphin, and that's the prince, and Margaret Tudor. And thirdly, Henry said that he was happy to postpone the receipt of money Charles owed him for a year. But there was a coda. Machado was to remind Charles of his promise that if Scotland were to invade England, France would declare war on Scotland. So it's gone up a notch. He's agreed to, to declare war. I wonder if he did agree or if Henry's just reinterpreting. <laughs> yes. You know, you said, you know, yes, you did. You did. Yes, you did. I just mentioned this, said Henry, because it looks as if they're about to invade. Mm. And he was also to ask Charles whether Henry could have the Duke of Albany, John Stuart, that's James, King James's nephew, and because he had a claim to the Scottish throne, because Henry wanted to use young John in the same way that James was using Perkin in a sort of ah. tit for tat of pretenders. Right. Yeah, if you if you support Perkin, I'm going to support your thorn in your side. Right. Which is very sensible. However, there was another reason for Machado to be there. Further instructions went as follows, quote, Item, if it should happen that the French king or any great personages of his council should make any question or inquiry, how the king and the king of Scotland accord seeing that the latter supports and entertains the Gasson in his kingdom, or, in similar words, and in case they do not speak on the subject, the said Richmond is to endeavour by all proper means to give occasion to such remarks. He may reply that concerning the affair, the king cares nothing about it, and that it is the least of of all his troubles. (laughs) For the said king of Scotland is unable to injure him in any manner whatever, except perhaps by making him spend money in vain. (laughs) Unquote. <laughs> of course, it's the money. <laughs> but I did like the fact that they're saying, if anyone should bring up the subject, you can tell him that I'm not bothered. Yeah. If no one brings up the subject, wheedle the conversation round to it. <laughs> <laughs> to say that I'm not bothered. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, effectively, Machado has been sent all the way to France to tell Charles he's not bothered. So. To lie. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. When Perkin was tracked down in Bewley Abbey, Machado was one of the people who was sent to pick him up and bring him back to Taunton. And Henry said, quote, He, Machado, tells me that the young man is not handsome. Indeed, his left eye rather lacks luster, but he is intelligent and well-spoken, unquote. Hmm. So, Gemma L. Watson, who wrote an article about Machado and Perkin, speculated that the eye thing may have been concocted by Machado. Strange eyes denoted untrustworthiness at this time. But Henry has a strange eye. 
That's true. So does that mean he's untrustworthy? <laughs> I don't know, but maybe Machado was sort of pandering to to Henry a bit because we hear about Perkin and his dull eye. I was wondering whether it came from anybody else or whether Machado was the original source for this ah. and whether he just said, oh, and he's got funny eyes. You know what, you know what yeah. they're like. But yeah, you're right. I'd forgotten, that Henry to say. <laughs> I'd forgotten about Henry's just, wonky eyes. <laughs> I'm just thinking you're saying that and your own king has that. Ooh, kind of implying that your king is sketchy too. Maybe the king's not aware of his eyes. I hope not. <laughs> he might have looked at his picture and thought, I'm sure my eyes aren't as unlevel as that. <laughs> October 1497... Machado was back at the French court, and this time he may have had with him Perkin's confession to say to oh. Charles, look, look, we knew we were right. In 1501, he was sent to Maximilian, and in 1503, get this, he was sent to the court of Denmark. Oh, really? But I don't know why. Oh! <laughs> I couldn't find to out why. To thank him for not sending the ships <laughs> that he never knew he was supposed to send. Why is the Denmark so elusive? I don't for know. For us in the records. Yeah. Mm, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe Denmark don't didn't keep records. I was a bit cagey with their records. I don't know. I don't know. But that's hilarious. He was obviously good at his job. The Milanese ambassador said that he was wise, endowed with wit and discretion, a man who saw everything. So, I mean, that's what you want with a diplomat. Yes. But was Machado a spy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you ask the question, it's like, yeah, most likely. <laughs> <laughs> he might as well be. Everybody else seemed to be. <laughs> Espionage is a notoriously difficult thing to discover in historical sources for obvious reasons. Yes. From time to time, you find payments made to an espi, which does seem incontrovertibly a spy. <laughs> yes. And at other times, it comes under the name of coureur, vespilio, explorateur, which are probably spies. Uh. And sometimes the payment is made under the title of secret business. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's a spy. <laughs> well, secret at that time uh, may have just meant private, so it might have just been a personal thing. So it's very difficult to work out whether the business was diplomatic or something more covert than that. Hmm. And I'm sure hmm. the dividing line was a bit blurry sometimes as well. I mean, at what point do you stop being a, a diplomat and start being a spy? True. The chronicler Philippe de Comines said that messenger, spy and diplomat were one and the same as far as he was concerned. Isn't it later that merchants and spies become one and the same? Yeah. Merchants start having trouble because mm. every spy is posing as a merchant. I think so. Mm. Yeah, court, the courts apparently extended every courtesy to dip diplomats, but they didn't trust them. But heralds were in a slightly different position. Heralds who picked up and passed on secrets from a court of their master's enemies were supposed to be punished by their master. And, what? Why? And the enemy was then assured that no advantage would be taken from the inf from the information which had been found out. Really? Yeah. Um, Why? I think probably it is to make somebody who is utterly trustworthy, and they must have all decided. Okay, we need one person. Yeah, we can't trust them at diplomats. We can't trust the merchants. Perhaps we just accept that. But I don't know. It seemed to me too good to be true. And I should imagine mm -hmm. the punishment inflicted on the herald was minimal and secret backhanders were great and that yes. the information probably was used because you're not just going to forget it, are you? If they no. say, oh, they're planning to invade you, you're not going to go back to them and say, I, I hear you're planning to invade, but don't worry, we're not going to make any <laughs> preparations. <laughs> yeah, no. <sighs> oh, no. Anne Rowe, who wrote the book Perkin thinks that Machado was sent to Portugal in August 1489 to spy for Henry. So we're going back a bit now. He was described as going, quote, for certain causes, unquote. Because Perkin was thought to be there in the service of Sir Edward Brampton, the subject oh. of our first cameo episode. Yes. Henry sent Richmond Herald, Machado, to Portugal, and Carlisle Herald, don't know who that was, to Bruges, where Brampton had come from. Uh, so they were both being sent to 
find out about Brampton and Perkin from where he'd mm-hmm. come from and where he'd ended up. And it's quite possible that Machado may have come across Perkin in Portugal. Huh. Roger Machado spent his last years of Southampton working as a searcher of customs. Uh, well, agents from enemy for... countries would sometimes try and smuggle arms or, or goods in, or ah, gold. Okay. And it was Machado's job to root these people out and arrest them. Okay. And that was where he died on the 6th of May, 1510. So wait, he died in... He was living in the house where they found all his stuff when he died? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Upper Bugle Street. And he was renting it from 1486 to 1497 for 13 shillings and sixpence a year. And the rental agreement was signed Richmond. Which seems odd. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, when the property was excavated, a stone-lined guard robe and a cellar tunnel were found full of artefacts, mostly dating from the 15th century, when Machado was renting the property. And it consisted of Italian majolica and Venetian glass vessels. So it was all quite posh stuff. Yeah. And much of it was was dining stuff and has proved invaluable and making a picture of how people ate and what they ate off in the sort of middling merchant classes of the time. I just find that so fascinating that it's there. And the fact it's glass and china. Yeah. We can't keep glasses from one week to the next. I don't know how they managed to... <laughs> they were more careful. Yes. <laughs> I was about to say they didn't have a stone sink, but they probably did. Oh. Mm. So that was the life of uh, Roger Machado, herald, diplomat, merchant, and possible spy. Yeah. How can, wait, no, he can't be. Mm, we're back to that. They say heralds aren't spies, and you've just said possible I know. Spies. I don't know. When, when, they, when he goes abroad, is he a diplomat or is he a herald? I don't know. Heralds wore really brightly colored. They're a bit, they look oh. a bit like the, the playing cards in Alice in Wonderland. Yes. So With you, all the gold braid and everything. Yeah, so you couldn't be, you couldn't be discreet as a herald because you were there in all your bright costume. <laughs> wandering around like a red peacock. Yes, there's no lurking behind <laughs> pillars. So I don't know whether, at what point he stops being a herald and starts being a diplomat, or whether he's always a herald when he's a diplomat. Whether you're never off duty as a herald, I don't know. Oh, I don't know either. Mm. The job of herald turned out to be a lot more complicated than I was. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still wondering why we have them in Canada. I don't know why we have them here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't for you, it's tradition. <laughs> That's a simple answer. I suppose that it just never stopped. I mean, at some point, you've got to say, right, we're getting rid of this this office. And if, yeah. if nobody ever does, it's still here. But yeah, at Canada, you've got to make the decision to start it. Mm-hmm. Mm. Hmm. That is really interesting. He's one of these people whose name pops up really briefly and then disappears again. And it says, oh, Roger Machado did such and such. And you think, but he did so much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, he's it's, it's, it's one of the nice people that sort of links Perkin and Nan Fan and Henry and Charles. King of and Denmark. King of Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> He'd actually gone to the court. I don't know if he met the king, but he went to the court. I imagine he met the king. So, yes, this man actually Maybe exists. that's when the King of Denmark discovered he was supposed to supply ships for yes. Perkin. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Well, that was really cool. Good choice. Hmm. Okay. Well, we'll okay. see you. Thank you. For <laughs> <that>. <laughs> we, we really ought to work out an ending for the cameo episode. <laughs> yes, we should. <laughs> we'll just... Until then, this is it. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes. We'll just see you around. <laughs> see you next time. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> That's our best ending ever. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha